Hi there, Dr. Rajiv Ayer here, bringing you more secrets on how you can be successful as an international medical graduate doctor in Canada and the USA. Thank you for being here. I welcome all the live viewers and the returning viewers for this live session today. If you are a returning viewer, I'm going to leave some timestamps in the description below so you can get in and see what questions are relevant to you. Now, in today's video, I actually label this good, bad, and ugly. There have been videos where we have talked about how to be successful and given you successful strategies. But think about this. The competition is so stiff. There are many IMGs who actually have not been successful and they have been trying for many years. So I want to touch a little bit upon that based on one of the comments that was sent by an IMG. Now in today's video, you can post your questions in the chat or you can also join live to talk to me by clicking the link that I just left in the comments below. So if you want to join the video, you can just click the link and then I can let you in so we can talk live on the video as well. So I want to give you that option. All right, I already see a few questions. So first of all, I wanted to take this question from uh, Dr. Nelly Diwani. So Dr. Diwani says, could you please talk about the best way to do critical care medicine fellowship and then find alternate entry path post that includes critical care medicine after UK anesthesia CCT? Most fellowships, seem to be ACGME and for U.S. residency applicants only. Well, let me try to understand this question first. So you're asking me, once you finish your anesthesia residency in UK and finish your CCT, how do you come to the U.S. to take a fellowship through the alternate entry path program? And the question also says, also, if possible, please discuss more about how to find alternate entry posts. Is it a case of contacting each department individually, sending them a CV, or look for a faculty post adverts first? All right. So first of all, let me tell you the answer to the second question is yes. So you send an application to individual departments seeking a position in the alternate entry path. I have mentioned this in a couple of videos. The way you do it is you send an email to the chair of the department and then you include a letter of intent plus your CV and your profile picture and you send it to the program director. Now I'm going to say you, Dr. Diwani, do send your CV to me. I will take a look and see how best to approach this, okay? So make sure to email me your CV, your letter of intent, and then we can go from there. And I'm telling you this on a live video. I'm not promising any position, but I can see what best I can do. All right, so let's move on to the next question. Oh, yes, so to touch base upon your CCT thing, in the US, the place of training does not matter. So Canada is biased towards certain countries. If you have done your training from a developed country, Canada looks at it in a different way. But in the US, it's not the case. They may look at it when you're entering the pathway, but when you exit out, everybody is treated equally. But in Canada, only those people who are trained from developed countries are eligible for Royal College certification. So these are some of the differences you have to keep in mind when you're focusing on Canada or USA, especially coming from UK after your CCT. Is this making sense? All right, so Dr. Dvivedi says, can you please talk about the new rule passed by Tennessee Medical Council? It's a fantastic question. I have just recorded a video on this. I'm going to release this as soon as possible. But in brief, I can say that 
This is for someone who has already finished their residency or PG training outside the USA and you come into the state of Tennessee, work for two years and then following this, you become eligible to get a full licensure, meaning after those two years of supervised training, you're a fully blown consultant in the US. Now, once you have the license, again, there are many things that are not clear about this pathway, but if I have to guess, you should be good to either do a private practice or be in an academic practice. They don't specify that. Things might change, but as of now. So stay tuned for the video this coming week. Okay, Dr. Mahmoud Asif asks, Hello sir, is step three a compulsory for alternate pathway for radiology? So Dr. Asif, when you're thinking of alternate entry path uh, program, once you finish this program, you would be a fully licensed physician in the US. You may also be board certified. Now to get a full license in the US, USMLE step three is a must. Now, there are exceptions to this. Again, that is applicable for only a few minority of IMGs. But for the most part, I would say doing USMLE would be the safest way to come into the US through the alternate entry path program or even through any path. All right, let's see what else is coming up. Dr. Humayun Bhatt asks, with MRCGP International and MCPS Family Medicine degrees, would there be any pathway to practice in Canada? Well, what I'm not sure here is, have you done your training in the UK or is this just an exam you're taking? Now, if you've done your training in the UK, you have your CCT, then you're directly eligible for the Royal College Certification Pathway. But on the other hand, if you're someone who has done just done these exams without having any training in the UK, or you, have, you don't have a CCT, then you have to still go through the traditional pathway, which is you either enter through a fellowship or you do a residency. Does that answer your question? All right. Dr. Ishan Sharma says, can you discuss about practice ready assessment? Now, Dr. Ishan, I have to say practice ready assessment is a pathway that is really not clear for most people because the website doesn't explicitly say many things about the practice ready assessment, perhaps other than saying you have to have five years of training out of which the last two years has to be in Canada. Now, I do know a person who actually used to assess IMGs. He's a very senior faculty in Canada. So I actually have an appointment with him this coming week. So I'm going to get more details about the practice ready assessment and try to post as soon as possible whatever I, le whatever I learn about this. Because I researched at Royal College, I didn't get much answers. Now, this person who actually assesses IMGs has a very nice first-hand information is what I'm guessing. So let me see. I'll talk to him and then keep you all posted about it. All right. Ishan Sharma asks, can you discuss about the practice study assessment in family medicine and which province is better option in family medicine? Again, as I said, I shall get back with more information in general about the practice ready assessment. So practice ready assessment for family medicine does have a special track on its own. And, um, you know, it's hard to say what is a better option, like which province is a better option. I would focus on something that's not very competitive. 
So, you know, I mean, there are, there are pros and cons. One way of thinking is there are a lot more IMGs in bigger provinces like Ontario and British Columbia, but they also have more competition. So I would say it's better to apply for more provinces than less because the last thing you want to do is get married to a particular province and say, I want to stay here. Sure, you can start with any province, but it's better to spread out your wings and see where best you can find a position. Once you finish your path, then you're free to move about anywhere. Now, these are some of the initial few years where IMGs usually have to go through some difficulties moving here and there in order to finish their training. All right, Dr. Ayesha Javed says, thank you, Dr. Divani, for asking the question. I also joined this live to find more about the AEP. I'm an OBGYN from Pakistan for past 15 years with ECFMG and MRCOG. I'm looking to move to the U.S. without residency. So, Dr. Ayesha, your pathway should be the, your plan should be the same. So, the way you would do it is you apply for a fellowship. Uh, sure. Um, most fellowships in the U.S., if you look online, are ACGME accredited fellowships. In spite of that, you can still apply to these fellowship programs, okay? That's because they may have the opportunity to take fellows out of the ACGME training curriculum. And if the candidate, if an IMG is outstanding, that IMG can function as a fellow along with other ACGME accredited fellows. Is that making sense? So yes, you apply to all the fellowships. You should apply to ACGME accredited fellowships, meaning the hospitals that have ACGME accredited fellowship because only these hospitals can take IMGs who are trained outside the country. You cannot get into private practice. You cannot get into smaller clinics as an IMG without being board certified in the U.S. Is this making sense how you approach this? So as I mentioned to Dr. Diwani, you follow the same path. You send an email to the chair of the department for OBGYN. You attach a nice letter of intent. You attach your CV and your profile picture. If you need my help, you can always explore www.imgsecrets.com and you can click on book an appointment and you can check all the help I provide for IMGs. All right, Dr. Diwani says, thank you very much regarding CCM fellowship. Is it worth still contacting departments and asking if they would make an exception to the ACGME role? I would not do that, Dr. Diwani. So when you apply, your focus should be to say how good you are, how outstanding you are as an IMG, and you seek for a fellowship in your application or in your email, your letter of intent should be so nice. You start with a story on your first paragraph and they get enticed. The program director or the chief of N or the chief of the department gets enticed to read the whole story, whole letter of intent and see what value you bring in. Now, if you ask things like, can you make an exception to something? This will weaken your application. You have to come out really strong because the programs get a lot of applications. So I receive quite a few applications from IMGs myself. So I can say what in general we look for is someone who comes out as really strong, really competitive, who has accomplished a lot of things. So do not write anything that might potentially weaken your application. If you speak to someone else, they may have a different opinion. And I respect that. But this is what I think based on my experience. All right. Dr. Oladayo asks, do you advise 
as residents to finish our training in our home country and leave to seek training opportunities in the UK? This is another fantastic question. Believe it or not, I have started recording. I have started to make script to record this exact same video on the same topic. The answer to this depends on many factors. What your long-term goal is, where your family is, and what do you want to accomplish with your life? So in general, I would say it's hard to generalize this answer for anyone in particular and depends on a lot of factors. I would say stay tuned to that video where I will go in deeper into how to make a decision. This is something that comes from the heart. Again, moving to a different country is a personal choice. It, it depends on so many factors. If you need help with your situational assessment, you can always explore the website www.imgsecrets.com and we can talk more about your particular situation. However, I do say stay tuned to the video where I'm going to speak more about this topic. All right. By the way, I want to thank you all for joining this live session and asking these questions because ultimately <laughs> I want you to get use out of this live session and benefit so you get your questions answered. I know you look at online, it's so confusing. So hopefully this is more direct and getting your questions answered directly. Getting back to Dr. Khan's question, I do some non-training job in UK for a year or two. Would it help me secure residency in Canada? I have heard score of MCCQ doesn't matter if you have some experience of UK in CB. So this is another fantastic question. So let me tell you, if you do anything in the UK, it might help a little bit because Canada, for some reason, respects experience from the UK. But if you have a CCT, that's a completely different story. Now you're eligible for Royal College training pathway. Now when compared to someone, I'm not sure what country you're from, but I'll take the example of India. So let's say someone who has come from India and another person coming from India has the exact same profile with one or two years experience in the UK, then that person with a UK experience may get a marginal benefit in terms of getting into Canada. Would it make a significant difference? It's hard to say because it also depends on many other factors. What is your training background? What is your academic background? How competitive you show up to be? How is your communication skills? There are so many other factors that play a role. Now, I have heard that score of MCCQ1 doesn't matter if you have some experience of UK in CV. I would not trust this because as an IMJ, the programs do not have any other way to assess you. I mean, the programs might say, we don't look at MCCQ1 scores. Sure, there might be an exception, but for the most part, the programs do look at MCCQ1 score. So as an IMG, your goal should not be to just pass, but rather aim high, aim to get 260, 280, something like that. I know it's easier said than done, but that should be your goal. Interestingly, I do have a video recorded about this. So my editor has just sent me the final edited version and I'm going to be releasing this video on MCCQ1 pretty soon as well. So stay tuned. All right, next question from Santosh Dvivedi says, is it possible for postgraduate IMG from India in internal medicine to get critical care medicine fellowship? That's a great question. In general, it is going to be difficult because you don't have an established track record in critical care medicine. In this case, what I would suggest is you come in as a fellow in internal medicine and then plan your year two or year three to do critical care medicine fellowship 
or some additional training in critical care medicine. It might be hard, uh, Dr. Santosh. It's not going to be very straightforward to jump into a subspecialty without having done any training in that subspecialty. But you do have the opportunity to do a fellowship in internal medicine. By the way, I want to remind you all that if you still want to join this live session and talk to me one-on-one -on -one through the video, you do have the option of doing that by clicking the link in the comment below through which you can join me live on the video. All right. I shall move to the next question from Dr. Abhishek Joshi that says, Third year MD anesthesia, I want to go to Canada on province-based fellowship pathway. I have noticed that some fellows get their restricted license and assistant professor position within two years. You're absolutely right. And I do have a video made specifically uh, for this topic. So the first step, Dr. Abhishek, you is you finish your anesthesia training, you come into Canada as a fellow. There have been quite a few IMGs who have done this. I have good friends who have been successful through this pathway. So I have seen this firsthand myself, but this is pretty competitive. Getting in as a fellow is not very easy. But yes, if you get in as a fellow, if you do really well as a fellow, you do have a good track record, academic track record during residency. You get in as a fellow, you do really well as a fellow. Then there is an option of where hospitals can take you on a restricted license, hospital specific restricted license, call you an assistant professor, give you approximately seven years to accomplish various different things. And then you get a license that is unrestricted which means after that, you can move anywhere in Canada. And this is what I refer to as the province-based specialist pathway. Dr. Oladayo says the new law in the U.S. state of Tennessee is looking attractive. I completely agree with that. It is fantastic. And the good news is I also hear the other states, especially Texas, is also getting stimulated in, in creating something similar. So if Tennessee becomes popular or rather successful, then I'm, I'm almost sure other states are going to look at this seriously to see if they can open up similar things for IMGs too. Again, stay tuned for the video that's actually going to be released soon on the steps you need to take as an IMG to get into this pathway. All right, Dr. Joshi says, while well, some have to do five to six years of fellowship to get assistant professor position and restricted license. So what's this matter? I am not entirely sure if I get your question correctly, but I am thinking there are some folks who do five to six years of fellowship and then get a restricted license? The answer to this is maybe this happens mostly in very competitive surgical specialties. So I have a friend, an IMG from India in ophthalmology in Canada who did fellowship for approximately four years or maybe even five, before which he was given a restricted license to function through the province-based specialist pathway. Yes, but the good news is in medical specialties, especially in medicine, pediatrics, or the subspecialties of pediatrics, internal medicine, radiology, anesthesia, they don't require five to six years. Usually, I have seen people being successful in these specialties within approximately two to three years. All right. We have a next question from Dr. Jai Prakash Reddy. How much will be the pay for clinical fellowship in Canada post PG with clinical experience in India? <laughs> Dr. Reddy, the pay question tends to be very popular. So 
Let me preface this by saying Canada offers two types of fellowships. One is where your country will sponsor your fellowship. They pay the hospitals in Canada so they can send their candidates to do a fellowship in Toronto or rather in, in Canada. Now, this happens, for example, with Singapore and many other developed countries. Now, with your training from India, this is not going to happen. So you have to look into positions which actually do pay you. So for this, the once you get into a clinical fellowship, your pay will be comparable to any other clinical fellow in the Canadian system. Now, the exact dollar amounts depends on various factors, on your specialty, on the province you're working, on the type of hospital you're working, because Canada as a socialized medicine, the funding for health happens from the government. Now, it also depends on how much money the hospital or the department is generating. In general, I can say the pay would be more than that of a resident and it would be enough to have a decent lifestyle for you and let's say your spouse, your, your kids and things like that. All right, Dr. Kulkarni says, I have finished my training in orthopedics. How do I proceed to gaining licensure in Canada? So Dr. Abhishek, I can say orthopedics is a very competitive specialty. Now your options are getting in as a fellow, which is very difficult in orthopedics or redo your training. Now, I don't mean to, I don't mean to say, I don't mean to discourage you from doing anything, but I do want to put the reality in front of you. I don't want to make it feel like everything is going to be easier because orthopedic is a highly paid specialty. There are many Canadian graduates who want to do orthopedics. And there are many countries who are sending their fellows to do orthopedic fellowship in Canada by paying money to the Canadian hospitals. Now, if there is a person coming from Singapore <laughs> bringing money, and if they see you, where you're coming, where they have to pay you, you can imagine who they would pay. Again, coming back to your options, your options would be to break through that, be very competitive and get into a fellowship, which is the best case scenario. The other option is you have to redo your residency training in Canada, which unfortunately sucks, but you know, sometimes not many options exist. Now, Dr. Kulkarni goes on to say, how do I get a fellowship in Canada having completed my postgraduate ortho training? Yeah, so this is a great question. And the, the path you want to choose is exactly similar to what I mentioned for anesthesia earlier. So you look at, now there are 17 universities in Canada, 17. And all of these 17 universities offer a fellowship. So for you coming from India, if you're good at French, you can focus on Quebec province. But most people from India may not be good at French. So for that reason, if you're not good at French, exclude Quebec province, focus on the other provinces. So you go into individual departments and then look at who the program director is and then look at who the chair is. So you email the chair along with your CV, your letter of intent and your profile picture. Now I want to say to all IMGs, the last thing you want to do is write an email saying, can you please give me a fellowship? This will not go well. And once a hospital rejects your application, it is very, very unlikely they would reconsider this as an IMG. So your first shot has to be the best shot. So make sure you go in really well, excellent letter of intent, professionally made CV. No fancy fonts, none of that. Professionally made CV, your profile picture and send an email and hope for the best. 
So, Dr. Reena Jagadish asks, how do you get your dependents, that is, parents, to Canada? Well, this would be more of an immigration-based question. So, I would say you should perhaps talk to an immigration attorney who is more experienced in this. But in general, I can say, to begin with, you can sponsor them a visitor visa, which is now given for the last I heard for a period of two years. And then once you become a Canadian citizen, you can sponsor permanent residency for your parents. I have seen that. I have seen this personally that many people do. All right, Dr. Asif, Muhammad Asif asks, thank you, sir, for letter of recommendation. Is it compulsory that LOR should be from US or LOR from India is enough? Well, it depends on what is this for, Dr. Muhammad. Are you asking for a residency or are you asking for a fellowship? I would say, in general, if you're able to get a letter of intent or letter of recommendation from the U.S., there's nothing better than that. But not most people will have that option. So I would say, whatever letter of recommendation you get is is make use of it as the best case scenario. Sure, if you have someone from US who can give you, take it. But if not, just get whatever you want. If you're from a surgical specialty, what makes a huge difference is you getting a letter from someone who can vouch for your clinical work. It also helps in medical specialties, but it's not a huge deal as opposed to surgical specialties. So it may not be someone really high up in your home country institution, but as long as you can get from someone who can vouch for your clinical work, I think that should be a, a significant one as compared to having uh, not having any letter of a recommendation from someone like that. Is that making sense? Dr. Ayesha Javed asks, will the Tennessee lobby for primary care only or surgical specialties too? I'm looking to get into OBGYN. The things about this new rule, which was just passed like a week ago, is not clear. But I have read this many times. And to me, it seems like this is applicable for all specialties because this is a state law. So once a state passes a law, my understanding I'm not an attorney or any uh, anyone on the government, but my understanding is that this should be generally applicable to all specialties. The reason why Tennessee passed this law is because they're mostly short of family care, family care physicians, but it should be applicable across the board is what my understanding is. There might be more information coming out about this pathway when they would make it more clear. This is very new. There has been so much discussion also going on in the US about all this and how this affects practice, how this affects the quality of care and things like that. So I have touched upon a few things in the video that will be released soon. Uh, Dr. Ayesha says, thank you for doing this. It's my pleasure. Again, I want to remind you all, if you need my personal help, you can always check www.imgsecrets.com where you can talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. I do help you based on your personal situation. All right. Dr. Humayun asks, if it's only examination-based degrees, would there be any way to enter into fellowship in family medicine or MPH program on scholarship in Canada? <laughs> I have to say, I'm not very clear actually about this question. I'm sorry, do you mind repeating this question all over again? So I'll move on to the next question, Dr. Butt, as you're posting your question. So if you can rephrase it, make it much more clearer, it would be helpful for me so I can give you a clear answer. So Dr. Kulkarni says, how much postgraduate experience is necessary for getting a clinical fellowship in USA and Canada? Is there any established pathway to get into Canada for an Indian IMJ? So Dr. Abhishek, this is a great question. 
I personally would say the more experience you have, the better it is. There is a balance here. Approximately, I can say if, if someone is experienced somewhere between three to 10 years, there might be exceptions. I'm just guessing if it's between three to 10 years post PG training, they have a pretty good shot. Again, it is not just based on the years of training. It is based on what your academic background is. Because think about this. If you're coming for a one year fellowship, you go back to India. It's a completely different story. Now, if you're coming to the USA for a fellowship and you're going to use that as a stepping stone to get into alternate entry path program, then your academic background should be very significantly uh, nicer than most other people. But on the other hand, if you do one year of fellowship, you want to move up to residency program, then your academic background may not make that much importance, but that would always help for you to get into a fellowship because you're getting into a fellowship without any residency in the US. Is that making sense? Is there any established pathway to get into Canada for an Indian IMG? Well, see, there is nothing like an established pathway. So the reason I am doing this is you won't find all this information online. You have to be experienced in order to be clear about these pathways. Now, there is nowhere on the internet where you can go and say the hospital or the province would say, okay, if you're an Indian IMG or if you're an IMG from this country, these are the pathways you need to take. So essentially, you apply to the hospitals with your best shot. I say this again and again because this is how I've seen IMGs get into the system and are being very successful. So the, the IMGs I know of, who are in the province-based specialist pathway are doing really well today. So I say it based on my own experience. So there is no established pathway, so you have to apply for a fellowship and then get into the system. So for that, you need to have the same things. Letter of intent, CV, profile picture, and then it has to be like really nice, really professional. No compromise, no exceptions for that. Again, if you need my help, you can always reach out to www.imgsecrets.com and explore all the options that exist there. Uh, let's get to the next one. Um, the next question says, Dr. Rajiv, are there any bridging courses in Canada to go from physical therapy to MD medicine and surgery? Considering I am a neurological physical therapist in the USA. You know, this is something I don't know the answer to. So if you can post this question on YouTube, so it reminds me that you do have a question, I can try to ask around people and see if I can get you an answer. Because my experience, for the most part, I know a lot about physician routes, but I don't know how to transition from physical therapy to MD other than getting back into medical school of course yeah getting back into medical school is an option but to me i think you're thinking of something if you're thinking of something else just just put it in the question so i can get an answer for you if i can find an answer okay dr can says thanks for answering first question please tell me is it also difficult to Canadian residency for old IMG like, I think like us? I graduated in 2017. I am now first year resident in anesthesia in Pakistan. It is extremely competitive to get into Canadian residency programs. This is well known. Every year, there are approximately two and a half to 3,000 IMGs who apply and only 15 to 20% of them, so 300 to 400, get successful. 
the majority of IMGs do not get into a residency program. Now, in your case, the best case scenario I can see is now, if you finish your residency in anesthesia, your experience or your year of graduation in 2017 may not matter that much. Now, as long as you're pretty highly accomplished academically in your residency, you finish your residency, and then you can explore the roots of either fellowship, which is what I recommend to IMGs. Again, I understand not everyone is eligible for this, or repeat your residency program. Now, those might be the options I can think for you, Dr. Khan. All right, Dr. Divani asks one more fellowship question. Since you say not to ask directly regarding exemptions, would you say just apply through SF match for CCM and include all programs and just accept the extra cost? If you are not trained in the system in the USA, I don't think you can go through the matching system. To apply for fellowships, you have to send an email directly to the chair of the departments. So the fellows, the matching process, be it in the USA or in Canada, for fellowships is only for those folks who have been through the system. Now, of course, if it's a residency matching, then you're an IMG who is going through either NRMP matching in the USA or columns matching in Canada. Does that answer your question? Do let me know if I'm answering your question because this is becoming one-sided. So I have no clue if your questions are getting answered. So please do let me know that your questions are actually getting answered. So I'm not speaking to myself. All right. If uh, Dr. Niru says, if there is an alternate pathway, why do people end up doing other jobs or also sometimes doing residency all over again? What a fantastic question this is. Yes, because the requirements for alternate entry pathway is very strict, meaning the alternate entry pathway is guided by American Board of Medical Specialties. Now, if, you're go, if you go through the alternate entry path program, then you have to go through, for, I'll take the example of anesthesiology. You could be any specialty, but the concepts are the same. Now, let's say you want to go through an alternate entry path program in anesthesiology. This will be approved by American Board of Anesthesiology. Now, in this case, the American Board sees if I'm giving an exception to some IMG to directly function as an attending, as a consultant in the USA, what is their background? How much are they accomplished? Is that making sense? So these are some of the things they, they see. So the requirements to qualify for an alternate entry pathway are extremely high. I personally know of quite a few people who have been successful through the alternate entry path program. Now, most people, in fact, when people come to me to ask for, am I eligible for alternate entry path program? I would recommend most people are not based on what I see with their CVs and other things because the requirements is so high. What happens is you apply to the American board. They take a few months to assess the application and they eventually end up rejecting the application. So once they reject, it's really hard to go back and ask. So that's why I keep saying, your first shot has to be the best shot. So for that reason, Dr. Nero, most people end up repeating residency all over again. If I have to guess, that is 99% of IMGs end up repeating residency all over again. It's only 1% who are eligible for the alternate entry path program. And those 1% are all very successful. And I know quite a few of them. All right, next question is, what are the other areas of alternate entry path programs apart from radiology, anesthesia, and surgery in the USA? Okay, 
most specialties offer an alternate entry path program in the USA. They are structured differently. For example, in radiology anesthesia, you come in as a fellow and then you can successfully be accomplished and then taken into the alternate entry path program. But on the other hand, if you're thinking of a specialty like pediatrics, the expectation is you are already functioning as a consultant in the USA. Now you might be wondering, how is that happening even though I'm not trained in the US? Okay, now many US hospitals have the ability to take IMGs directly as a consultant even without alternate entry path programs. These are academic institutions. So let's say there is someone who is trained in the UK. He's a, he or she is a pediatrician. That person comes to the US directly as a consultant. They function as a consultant for let's say three years, four years, whatever it is. And then they apply to American Board of Pediatrics saying, give me eligibility in the alternate entry path program. Now in that case, the benefit is they would be board certified by American Board of Medical Specialties. So that's the difference between getting through the alternate entry path program and directly coming in and working as a consultant. So th that is the answer for your question. All right. What are the other options? We talked about that and so Dr. Adarshna says, how is the scope of psychiatry in Canada for an IMG? I have completed residency from Ames. So congratulations. It's a fantastic place to do residency from. I see so many outstanding IMGs from Ames. Just amazing. Anyway, to answer your question, well, psychiatry is thankfully not, it is competitive, but not as much as a surgical specialty. So your approach would be preferably try to get in as a fellow in psychiatry. And then because of your training from AIMS, make use of that and try to break through the province-based specialist pathway. That would be your best case scenario. Again, if you're unable to do that, then your other option would be to enter residency. So many people actually come in as a Canadian PR because you can apply for Canadian permanent residency from your home country. Most IMGs who come through this pathway struggle because they come into Canada as a Canadian PR, they leave everything from their home country. They leave everything. They leave the job, they leave the home, they leave everything, they come to Canada. They don't have a job. I was just looking recently looking at a video just to apply for a cashier job in Canada. That person was saying there were 300 applicants, 300. And imagine what would happen applying for a job as a skilled person because you are all skilled people. You're all IMGs. You've been through medical training, you've been through many of you have also completed residency or doing residency. So you're all very skilled professionals. The competition is so high. So that's why I say coming in as a fellow would be the best case scenario and, and try to have your steps planned ahead of time. The worst case scenario is just come in as a permanent resident and then think of what I need to do because you know, it sounds fantastic. You are a permanent resident of Canada Coming into Canada for the first time feels really good, <laughs> but next what? This is something you have to think ahead of time. Anyway, I hope I answered your question, Dr. Arshmi. All right, Dr. Abhishek asks, as you're talking about Tennessee, we have to give you a simile. <laughs> Another great question about Tennessee. So Dr. Abhishek, the the specifics of this pathway are not clear yet. But if you ask me, I would say yes, you need to give you SMLA. I would also say, give you SMLA, all steps, BCFMG certified, and also complete your USMLA step three. Because 
you need this for a full license plus this will help you get an H1B so you don't struggle on J1. All right, there is another question. As you were talking about tenancy, we have to give you SML for that position or without your SML. I think we talked about it. All right, next question is, what will you advise a fresh graduate IMG planning to work in Canada do? Well, if you're already in Canada, then you have to make yourself competitive to get into Canadian columns matching. As we've been talking about, it's not too easy. So the things you need to do is focus on getting a really high MCCQ1 scores. Do really well on your NAC exam. And then try to build your CV. So try to find a research job. Again, I, I get it. It's not easy to find. But try your best to find a research job. Work with Canadian consultants and explore the opportunities if you have those, because if you have a letter of recommendation from a Canadian consultant, that'll help a lot. Make sure you have a specialty in mind that you want to do. You know, sometimes IMGs think, okay, I'm going to try family medicine because that's easy. I'll try radiology because that's easy. I'll try pediatrics. Not a good strategy. Because once you make a plan, well, you can keep something as plan B, but you should have your primary specialty in mind. Let's say, for example, it's pediatrics. Then you go into conferences in pediatrics. It's expensive. You're going to spend a lot of money for this, but you have to go there and speak to program directors. You build connections. You do all those things. So you slowly start building your CV over a year or two. So when you apply for comms matching, you turn out to be an outstanding candidate. By the way, I want to acknowledge to you all for um, being here. So thank you again for being here and asking these questions and getting this answered. All right, so Dr. Mahesh asks, I completed DNB anesthesia with three years of experience, but I didn't have any publications on my name. Can I try for Canada or USA without giving any exams like USMLE or MCCQ1? Can you tell how to start? Sure. I get questions from DNBs more and more these days. So Dr. Mahesh, in the USA, you must have USMLE in order to do clinical exams or rather clinical practice to get into a fellowship. But in Canada, to enter a clinical fellowship, you do not need any exams to begin with. Again, then eventually it depends on what path you take and then that would determine whether you would need an exam or not. So the first step I would say is you have to make a determination or make a decision as to whether you want to move to the USA or Canada. Now, because you've done D and B and you said you don't have any publications, so you have to craft, you have to bring in all your significance, all your positives you have during your anesthesia training, and then highlight this when you apply for a position for a fellowship. Most people, almost all people, in your instance, end up repeating residency all over again. But I would say it never hurts to try for a fellowship. You're not going to lose anything. The maximum they might say is no. So it never hurts. All right. So next question is, If I get Royal College exam eligibility letter and give Royal College exam via PE or pathway, is it valid in the US? This is another great question. Now, once you become Royal College certified in Canada and you get a full license and decide to move to the USA, you do not have to write any exams. You do not have to repeat residency. The only thing you want to make sure is do you fulfill the requirements of getting a license in the USA? For example, let's say 
you decide to come into the state of Pennsylvania. Now, you look into the Pennsylvania State Medical Board licensing requirements and you have to meet all those criteria. Most of the times, or almost all of the times, people who have a full license in Canada and are Royal College certified are eligible to get a full license in the US. There might be some things you may have to jump through back and forth depending on your individual circumstance. But for the most part, it's a lot easier. And it's the same is true. If you are certified in the US, decide to go to Canada to practice your specialty, then the same thing. You just have to make sure you meet the licensing requirements in that particular province. Again, nothing is clear cut. There are various ways, but if you are in this situation and you want help, I can always help you out. All right. Where are we? Quite a few questions. All right. So next question is by Dr. Mahesh. Sir, can you please elaborate regarding Tennessee law, how IEMGs are going to be benefited? So one more question on Tennessee. So Dr. Mahesh, so as I mentioned earlier, I just have done a video and it's currently being edited from my editor. And I'm going to release this as soon as possible. So stay tuned where I give all the information about Tennessee. But I can say that the IMGs are going to be significantly benefited from this pathway because Tennessee now says you just have to do two years of supervised training in the state of Tennessee and then you can get a full state license. So this means you do not have to repeat your residency all over again. The good news is the other states, if this is successful, the other states will potentially or may potentially look into this to see if this is an option for other states as well. So this is a welcome move for IMGs and this is going to bring in a lot of IMGs to the US without having to repeat residency. Which, the question from Adel asks, which master's program do you think has more scope for employment? QI or epidemiology or something else? This is a tough question for me because I'm not presently in the market for looking out for post-employment after master's. Now I can say, I didn't know there is a master's program in QI, or maybe there is, there is. Uh, Johns Hopkins has one master's program and there are other places. I would say QI perhaps would have more opportunities because once you finish a master's program from a reputed organization, then you can be employed potentially in major university hospitals to help as part of QI team. So many hospitals have set up a quality improvement and safe patient safety teams. And they have a lot of uh, nurses and they have a lot of QI professionals who are helping out do QI projects. Now more and more journals are now accepting QI publications, publications on patient safety. So based on this, because epidemiology has been there for many, many years and it's a saturated market. So my guess is, again, you may want to do your own homework about this, but my guess is I would bet QI may have a marginally better chance than epidemiology. All right, Dr. Adele asks, what made you go to the US after having the eligibility to work in Canada? That's a fantastic question. Dr. Adele, I've been thinking of um, making a video exclusively about this topic but because of all the questions I get from IEMGs, I haven't had a chance. Money or weather or something else? Great question. So I am an IEMG trained from India. Canada is biased towards certain countries. I'm, I'm an anesthesiologist. So I did my 
PG in anesthesia from India. Now, if someone comes from a developed country into Canada, they get a Royal College certification eligibility. But on the other hand, if an IMG comes from India, they do not get the eligibility to be board certified in Canada. But in the US, that is different. If you come into the US through the alternate entry path program, irrespective of what your country is, once you're in the alternate entry path program, you can be potentially board certified. So that was a major reason why I moved to the US because I wanted to play it safe I wanted to be board certified because I was worried in case there is any changes with the rules, with the laws. I just didn't want to take any chances. It's, it's unlikely it is going to be a problem. And if you think you want to focus on Canada, that's totally fine. Remember that if you're an IMG from uh, not from a developed country, training not from a developed country, then you won't be eligible for Royal College certification. That's the only difference, but apart from that, there is no differences in training. Anyway, coming to me, that was the reason I, I moved to the US from Canada. All right, Dr. Bert asks, my MRCGP International is an examination based only, I have not done training from UK. I want to enter into fellowship program in Canada. Yeah, so Dr. Humayun, so it's the same path that I've been mentioning you have to reach out to the chair of the departments of what your specialty is and then send a CV, send a nice letter of intent and then your profile photo and then apply for a fellowship because you don't have a central system like matching or anything to get into a fellowship in Canada. All right. Uh, Yes, it's my pleasure and I'm glad you're finding benefits from my answers. Uh, Dr. Rina asks, thanks for answering my first question. How competitive is cardiothoracic surgery fellowship if you have any idea? So cardiothoracic surgery fellowship is pretty competitive. But the good news is less and less local graduates are going into cardiac surgery. So I wonder if this was one of the reasons why there is an alternate entry pathway in cardiac surgery. So it is worth pursuing. I'm getting a call from Dr. Farhat, so let me pick this up. Hi, Dr. Farhat. Dr. Farad, are you there? It's Dr. Farad, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yeah, good evening. Can you hear me? I can. Um, well, I have asked a couple of questions. Yes, I've asked a couple of questions, but still I'm not clear yet. I just want to ask that uh, um, uh, I've done my MRCGP and MCPS from Pakistan, and uh, I've not done training, uh, but my parents are there. They are residing in Canada. I'm intending to go to Canada. So what pathway would be easier for me? Uh, also, I'm uh, interested in Master in Public Health. So could you help me out? So what uh, especially on scholarship basis. What is your residency training in? My residency training is in family medicine. Okay. Well, I think your best case scenario would be to get into family medicine as opposed to getting into a master's program because now with, with master's program, I would keep master's program as mainly as plan B, not as plan A. There are a couple of things. So one is, I assume you're a Canadian citizen, right? No, I'm not Canadian citizen. My parents are residing in Canada, but I am in Pakistan. I see. Okay. 
because as an IMJ, it's pretty hard to get scholarship for any master's program. But, well, let me not get to that. But anyway, there are, so your best case scenario would be to get into as a fellow or redo your residency training. So once you get into master's program, there are pros and cons. The con is you would be spending quite a bit of money and time for something you would think might happen. So instead of that, I think if you, again, this is my opinion. If you ask someone else, they may say something else. But if you ask my opinion, you should focus on getting into either a fellowship or repeating residency all over again, because this will eventually be more of a definitive successful path as compared to doing masters. But if you can find that position and if you do end up masters, you know, there are some of the things you need to keep in mind. One is it's not easy to find sponsored funding for that because the universities expect a huge payment and masters is not cheap. You know, I have done masters in the U S so I know masters is not cheap. And, um, also, during masters, you need to put in a lot of effort in a different direction. So it, I, I worry that it might be a bit of a, a tangential move as compared to your primary focus. Does that make sense? Uh, well, uh, okay, I understand that masters is quite expensive, but uh, definitely I want to move to Canada. But I don't want I don't want to waste my years because this is going to take a couple of years to get the PR. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, if there could be any chance that I can enter into a fellowship program, because your voice was a muffled in between, so I just missed a couple of things. So mm -hmm. I'm really sorry for that. Um, uh, I do not fit into the match program that you had mentioned before because I do not have training from UK. I have done this MRCGP International. And uh, yes, there's another pathway in Australia recently. They have recognized this and there's a PEP specialist pathway in Australia, but I'm not much interested to go to Australia. So... Um, could it be any way that if I enter into a fellowship program in any of the provinces over there? So, yes, you could certainly apply for fellowship in any provinces. But the second thing I want to clarify is that anybody is eligible for residency matching. As long as you're, you know, you meet certain basic criteria. I mean, I did not mean to say that you have to have a training from UK to be eligible to get into residency training. You are certainly eligible as long as you meet some basic criteria like your medical college is recognized by WHO and you meet certain other criteria. Yes. Yes, my medical college is yeah, recognized so, by WHO. So if WHO. you ask that me... Uh -huh. So if you ask me, I personally favor getting in as a fellow because that actually gives you a Canadian experience, that gives you pay, that gives you connection with Canadian consultants, and the possibility of getting successful with next steps is much higher. I'm not saying this is easy. This is still very tough, but the possibility, so that's what I would primarily focus on. And then keep your masters as, as a separate plan B. Okay. So would it be possible that if I send my CV to you that you have mentioned a couple of times, I've seen your YouTube um, videos and uh, you have mentioned about sending the CV and you can have a look at it. And if you can guide me that, how should I go about it? Uh, certainly, yeah, you can send me your CV. I'll take a look. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. It was yeah. nice talking to you. Yeah, like Good day. thanks have for good joining. Day. Thank you. All right, that was great. Let's move on to the next question. Again, if anyone wants to join and speak live, you're more than welcome to. All right, I missed the flow where I was. Oh, we talked about the cardiothoracic uh, fellowship. And uh, let's say the next question, can I apply 
to fellowship in U.S. nephrology without steps or residency in U.S., but only two-year fellowship in Canada. So you actually need USMLE steps to apply for fellowship in the U.S. Now, if you have completed your Canadian fellowship, you are certified in Canada, you have a full license in Canada, that's a different story. But if you have not done any of those, you actually do need USMLE steps, uh, at least be ECFMG certified in order to apply for a fellowship. I mean, you can apply anytime in order to get a fellowship in nephrology. All right. Dr. Vishal says, I want to do arthroscopy fellowship. I applied to many universities in Canada, but they didn't reply to mail at all. Well, um, Dr. Vishal, you have really picked a super competitive fellowship to do in Canada. As I mentioned earlier, there are many people who are paying money to do a fellowship in Canada. So the hospitals have a lot more incentive to pick those candidates to to do fellowship as opposed to someone where they have to pay money to do a fellowship. But hopefully you have not applied to all 17 universities. If you still have any university that you have not applied to, and if you want my help for that, I can certainly help you with that. Okay? All right. So Mohammed Asif says, thank you, sir, for your support. Okay. It's my pleasure. Dr. Ayesha says, I've been scoring your videos and they're very helpful. Thank you for doing this live and answering in real time. Much obliged, sir. Well, thank you. That, that's a useful feedback. I appreciate for that feedback. I have a feedback that says, greetings of the day, sir. Thank you. And uh, ah, no, I have a lot more feedbacks as to this is helpful. You're really providing information not found anywhere else. Thank you for that. Dr. Amal asks, what is the simplest way for a final year medical student to start residency in Canada? <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't know if there is a simple way, but the way is that you have to meet certain eligibility criteria, as I was just mentioning. Your medical college must be recognized by WHO. You need to have a sponsor notes for Canada or from Canada about your medical college. You have to finish certain exams like the MCCQE1 and the NAC, and then apply for CARMS matching, which is a centralized process to apply to do residency in Canada. That is the only way I know of. So Dr. Adel asks, just out of curiosity, how many publications did you have before applying to US so that we can aim for at least that much? Well, that's a great question, Dr. Adel. Maybe I should definitely make a video about myself. So I did my residency, as I mentioned, from India, from a fantastic place called a PGI MER in Chandigarh. So I was really fortunate to be in uh, PGI in Chandigarh where the academic throughput and my, my co-residents were so outstanding. I mean, I was really with the best possible case scenario surrounded by myself. So I, for that reason, I got my first publication during my anesthesia residency and I was able to quickly scale up on the number of publications I had during my residency and during my stay in PGI MER after finishing my residency. And by the time I applied in the US, I approximately had about 60 or 60 or 65 publications, I think. So, the next question about Divyan says, can we do internal medicine residency from Harvard Medical School after USMLE? I really love the fact that you're aiming really high, but if you are a competitive candidate, you can certainly do 
your residency from Harvard Medical School. Uh, the things you have to keep in mind if you need to go to Harvard is this is based on my co-residents who went to Harvard as IMGs. So the thing they did was they got into a research position at Harvard. They probably did this for a few years, perhaps more like three or four, I think. And then that got them enough publications, enough letter of recommendations that they actually were successful in doing residency at Harvard, which is not easy to do. And so this was the path they, they took and they turned out to be successful. So I would say, suggest something similar. It would be extremely difficult to match into Harvard directly coming as an IMG. But if you spend a few years in a very reputed place in the US, building up your CV, producing publications, doing research, doing academic activities, then certainly you would be in a very good position to be eligible to get a residency program at Harvard. All right. Next question says, what is the master with the best job opportunities for an IMG doctor in Canada or the USA? I am not entirely clear. Are you referring to masters in the sense master of public health, master of science, business masters, something like that? Or are you referring to masters in terms of being a residency program? So do you mind please clarifying that so I can get you the right answer? In the meanwhile, I'll move on to the next question. So Dr. Mothi Ram Chaudhary says, what is the pathway to immigrate to Canada as a fresh graduate, as a physician? So uh, Dr. Mothi, just as I was mentioning, the only path would be the long-term path would be to do a residency in Canada. So as a fresh graduate, unfortunately, you don't have many options or rather you don't have any other option apart from doing residency either in your home country and then move to Canada or do a residency in Canada. So it's kind of the same thing that I was mentioning about how to be competitive with Harvard. You may have to go through some of the same things as a fresh IMG to be eligible in matching in Canada because the competition is so intense. All right, so Dr. Guddu says, sorry, Gudda says, also as far as I know, there are many programs like four to five percent that match residents out of NRMP. And thanks for answering the last question, got my answer. And can you shine on other countries like Singapore? Well, see, for the most part, I can't comment on out of match process. Sure, it, it might be happening, but it's really difficult to say for certain what's happening and why it's happening and in what direction it's happening. So it's more beneficial to focus on the established NRMP matching program as an IMG. But if, if it's a local graduate who is outstanding, he or she may be offered an out of match position. Well, that's, that's separate. That's not applicable for IMGs. Now, can you shine on other countries like Singapore? You mean going to Singapore and working as an IMG or coming from Singapore to Canada and USA? Well, if you're, going, if you're thinking of going to Singapore, now, my experience in Singapore is just based on my travel and speaking to IMGs. I have not lived or worked there. But I can say that Singapore follows kind of the same system as Canada or the US in terms of their residency matching. It's highly competitive. It's very difficult to get into case in a residency program in Singapore. But on the other hand, if your question refers to an IMG coming from Singapore into Canada or USA, you're in a fantastic position because Canada approves Canada considers Singapore as an approved jurisdiction, meaning they get a direct Royal College eligibility if you're trained from Singapore. And in the USA, there may be marginal benefit if you come from Singapore. But as I mentioned earlier, 
irrespective of where the IMG is coming from, everybody who comes through the alternate entry path path in the US eventually become board certified. Dr. Khan asks, between USA and Canada, which is easier to get into residency considering that I am a first year resident in anesthesia, graduated in 2017. So one more great question, Dr. Khan. Hands down, it's the USA, mainly because there are more programs and they're more used to IMGs than Canada. In Canada, there are only 200 to 400 IMGs who get matched every year. In the US, it's more than 10,000 IMGs who get into residency program every year. But the application pool is also quite different. There are a lot more applicants in the US. But to keep your answer brief, to keep the answer to your question brief, I would say it's the USA. Dr. Divyansh asks, is there any coaching or counselor who we can hire for making our USMLE process easy and help us? So I am not sure of any uh, person. I don't know of anyone whom I trust. So I don't, I don't speak about third parties whom I don't have experience about. But if you want my help, you know, I don't teach you USMLE questions or anything, but if you want my help as more like a life coach, you can always explore my website, www.imgsecrets.com. And there is an option of booking an appointment with me from the website. All right, so we have another question from Dr. Lempe, who has quite a few questions. Let's see one by one. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. I'm thinking of coming at the college for healthcare assistance program for six months. If I apply at a college without PG work permit, should I apply for both study and work permit? So this is again a question to someone who is very experienced in immigration and immigration attorney. But I can say based on my limited experience, you probably will come on a study permit if you're coming in as a student. If you're coming in for a work, which includes something like a research job or a fellowship, something like that, then you would be coming on a work permit. Okay, all right, let's, I hope that answered your question. I know you have quite a few questions that kind of sound similar. So I'm going to skip to the next person, but if something didn't get answered, make sure to indicate that. Now, the next question is from uh, Dr. Shazia Khan, who says, what are chances of MRCGP international graduates getting entry through PEP specialist pathway or one should get AMC one instead? Now, I started, when I started this video, I did mention that the clarity on the practice entry route or practice eligibility route is not very clear. The website doesn't say anything much. And I reached out to Royal College, I didn't get much answers. So I do have an appointment with someone who is very experienced in this pathway next week. So I'm gonna to speak to that, uh, who used to be a program director assessing IMGs. So I used, I'm going to talk to him and I'll see what information I can get about this and then keep you all posted about what I learned about the practice eligibility route. All right, next question is from Dr. Faiz who says, I am a first year MBBS student in Pakistan. My future plan is to become a doctor in Canada. Uh, so Faiz, I'm, I'm so glad you're thinking ahead of time. I did not have so much vision when I was your age to think so much ahead of time, but I'm glad you're doing that. So be an outstanding candidate, do really well in your exams and just plan ahead. Make sure your medical college is recognized by World Health Organization. If they don't, there are ways to go about it. 
and you make sure you do your mccq1 exam your nac exam you really score high on those you start working on some research some voluntary work oh one thing since you're a first year medical student you should do is you should look for clerkships in usa or canada so clerkships are essentially clinical experiences that actually would add significantly to your cv so you become competitor to when you apply for matching in canada four five or six years down the line so dr harry sodi asks are there any chances for easy matching in comps in coming years as there is severe shortage of doctors in canada is the government going to do something what a fantastic question so this can be a video on its own but i'll keep it brief and say it is very frustrating that canada is having so many shortage of doctors but they have so many difficulties for imgs so i'm already so experienced to come and work in canada now canada is unlikely to change any of the thing in comps but what they might do is they might actually open alternate pathways through which imgs can come so one of the alternate pathways that many people have been successful is what i refer to as a province based specialist pathway i have talked about this in this video i have videos made for that so essentially you apply for a fellowship and then once you get through that first barrier you look for additional opportunities in various provinces in canada so you become successful to be an independent consultant or an attending physician in canada all right uh i want to ask what the next question says i want to ask what is the simplest way for a final year medical student to get into residency in canada as an img from algeria well i have been talking about the things you can do as a medical student and um, it's the same thing you know you have to be very competitive make sure you get good scores on your mccq1 your nac and get some canadian research experience if possible and you can do some observerships build your cv so when you apply for comps matching and so you're pretty competitive to get into a residency program all right the next question says is it difficult to get pain medicine fellowship during the four years of aap anesthesia if i am already trained in interventional pain medicine also how competitive are the aap well it depends on a few things it depends on where your training is from and what type of interventional pain medicine have you done how is your academic background because the alternate entry path program is classified in anesthesia is classified into two types one is a clinician educator pathway for imgs who come from a developed country and the other is a research and fellowship pathway for all other imgs so it really depends on where you fit in in general it's slightly easier slightly not much to get into the clinician educator pathway assuming you're trained from one of the high income countries does that answer your question but what what i want to say is just to finish that point is that you definitely should apply for a fellowship and see where you stand because i see that you have already trained in interventional pain medicine so make sure you apply oh um one of my friends recently reached out to me if any of you watching are already certified in the USA and looking for a J1 waiver job in anesthesia reach out to me i have a position open at the moment all right do we need dr santosh asks do we need usmla part 1 and part 2 before applying for fellowship in the USA yes you do need both parts you have to be ECFMG certified in order to be eligible for any clinical fellowships in the USA if you're going on the research side 
you don't have need any exams, but you would not be doing any clinical work there. And most of these fellows come in on a J-1 visa. But on the other hand, if you have ECHMD certified coming through a clinical fellowship, most of these folks come on an H-1B visa. An H-1B visa is any day better than, has a lot, I shouldn't say better, but has a lot more benefits than a J-1 visa. Uh, Dr. Adel continues to say, great talk, Dr. Rajiv, thank you. One question is, where do we get the list of states in US like Tennessee? which have these special pathways for IMGs are like Pennsylvania, which have some exceptions. Well, you get it from me, or rather from my website, www.imgsecrets.com. Do follow this. At this time, Tennessee is the only state that is offering this option, not Pennsylvania. It's just Tennessee. More likely, there will be more states in the coming years. But as of now, it's only Tennessee. All right, Dr. Sodhi asks, are there any chances for easy matching in carbs? Oh, I think we touched upon this. This might be a repeat question. Dr. Yugesh asks, I'm an MS anesthesiologist who completed MD in 2006. I have been practicing anesthesia since in a non-academic institution. Now I want to move to Canada. Please suggest me the appropriate route. Oh, doctor, you guys, this is a tough situation. You know, there are a couple of things that's working against you. So one is your year of graduation is in 2006. More so, the other thing working against you is that you've been in a non-academic institution, meaning you have not had any... Uh, publications or things like that. This is going to be a tough situation. I mean, you could still apply for a fellowship highlighting how much experienced you are clinically and hope for the best. But I would suggest one other opportunity you can definitely explore is Tennessee. Because as we have been talking about Tennessee has released a new rule where IMGs can work for two years and then get a full license. So with your experience of approximately, what, 17 years, I think you should explore uh, Tennessee is what I'm thinking. And once, let's say, once you're established in Tennessee, you get a full license and then you can explore other pathways of what else you can do. Again, these are easier said than done because now you're uprooting your whole family. You may have children, but something you can think of. Uh, Dr. Harry says, what are the chances of getting fellowship in Canada and orthopedics? I heard orthopedic fellowship or is next to impossible kindly guide. Yes, I've been telling about orthopedics. It's an extremely competitive specialty because it's paid well and there are many people coming with money to get into a fellowship. It is extremely competitive. You're right. The chance of getting as an IMG without much experience is, is unfortunately pretty slim. Again, I say just apply. You're not going to lose anything by applying. Just give your best shot. The maximum they would say is no, or they may not even respond back to you. But at least you would know you have applied. But just don't apply. Make sure you send in a very solid competitive application. Because once they reject, you cannot go back to the same university. They are not even going to look at you. All right. The next question from Dr. Adel says, for an academic post in University of Toronto, apart from fellowship, is master's program a requirement and how many publications are they looking for? The master's program is not a requirement. If you have it, it helps, but no. Most people in University of Toronto, to my knowledge, do not have a master's program. Sure, they're all Royal College certified. And how many publications are they looking for? Now, University of Toronto, 
tell us about themselves. The, they are the most well-published university in Canada. So they look for what is called an impact factor of journals. So they look for publications in high impact journals. They don't have a number, but obviously the higher the publications you have, the better it is. And the higher the impact factor of the journal you're published in, the better it is. An approximate number is an impact factor of five. If you need more information about impact factors, you can always go to Google and, and type in impact factor and find out more about this. All right, so we have a question from Dr. Anna who says, I'm a medical microbiologist in Pakistan. What should be my route to clinical fellowship in Canada? I'm currently thinking about applying for PR. So Dr. Anna, I, you know, I get concerned when people apply for PR in Canada and then move as a PR. This is because there are many, so Canada wants a lot of skilled talent. So they give PR based on many different uh, reasons. When you apply from Pakistan, you perhaps become eligible based on the point-based system. Now let's say you come into Canada as a PR, you must have a plan as to what your next steps are because most IMGs I've seen who come to Canada as a PR without having a plan suffer the most. They don't get they don't get past beyond certain stage. So anyway, so to get back to your question, you certainly can apply for a clinical fellowship, but I would be very cautious and, and think twice before you apply directly for a PR. But rather, what I suggest IMGs do is apply for a fellowship, move in as a fellow, or move on a job, and then get your PR based on Canadian experience class. I'm not saying this is easy. But as long as you get your clinical fellowship in Canada and you have two years of Canadian experience, your PR will come in six months. It's the easiest route I know of to get a Canadian PR. And this is what I suggest most IMGs do. How many letters of recommendations are required to apply for fellowship is a question from Reena Jagadisha. There is no number, but I would say three would be a good number. So when you submit your CV for a fellowship, you can actually mention your references at the end saying who your referees are. Because when I get an application for a fellowship and I see there are some referees and I see these referees are from a place I can trust or rather I know of, then I'm a lot more confident about this candidate as opposed to other candidates. Dr. Adel says, excellent session. We'll definitely be taking a personal session from your website. Thank you. So Dr. Lempi is posting me questions. I think I answered the question that if I apply at a college without PG, that if you're coming in for a study, you would be coming in on a study permit. Again, as I said, this would be a question to someone who is an experienced immigration consultant, because obviously I'm not one. All right, so next question is from Dr. Mahesh who says, how to get research fellow position? If I'm not wrong, it doesn't require USMLE steps post graduation from India. So that I can get some publications and try fellowship by alternate pathway. What a fantastic question. Dr. Mahesh, you're right. If you're coming in as a research fellow, you do not need USMLE steps. You typically would come in on a J1 visa, but then you should be using this as a stepping stone to get into your next steps, which is usually 
repeating residency because what happens is once you come in as a research fellow you would be out of clinical work for 2 years or 3 years or whatever it is and then the programs get a little hesitant to get someone into the alternate entry path program you see there is a balance here but if your goal is to come in and repeat residency or do residency in the us this is a good approach you can come in as a research fellow but remember you will be coming on a j1 and then you use the you use the money that you get your pay from as a research fellow which is pretty decent and then you write your usmle steps and then you have some publications you may be even able to get a letter of recommendation depending on where you work as a research fellow and then apply for matching can you make a detailed video practice ready assessment in family medicine practice ready assessment shaminder courses dr kor i am going to do some research on this so because this pathway is not very clear as to what are the details so i actually am planning to speak to some people from canada who are established who assess IMGs in pathways like this and see what they have to say and then based on that i think i'll make a video on this depending on what answers i get all right so the next question is hi doctor is there any particular format for applying for research position in a medical university in canada will a standard cover letter and cv showcasing my academic details and experience work yes there is no specific format you have to i would say keep your letter of intent short usually one page eleven size font uh usually one inch space margins arial helvetica those type of fonts and keep it one page and make your cv look really professional and um that should be enough there is no specific format and then you send an email now because one thing you guys have to remember is because these hospitals keep getting so many applications unless you make your email application really punchy they i mean they would definitely look at the email there's no doubt because i look at all the emails i get so i would assume most of us in us and canada or all of us look at all the emails we get but the question is are they going to respond back to you in a positive way so for that you should showcase the values you bring in and how excellent you are as an img candidate that's what makes a difference all right the next question is from dr patricia wu who says good day doctor as a second year resident in internal medicine I'm wondering if it is possible to apply for fellowship in Canada and proceed to obtain training in other related subspecialties that is cardiology. You can certainly apply for a fellowship but to be eligible to get into a fellowship you must complete your residency training. Remember the fellowship application time usually lags by 1 to 2 years. For example now it's june of 2023 they might be accepting applications starting july of 2024 or july of 2025 so you have to plan it accordingly based on that well i would say the first thing is you get into a fellowship in internal medicine and then you have to explore the options without any sub specialty training it's it's kind of difficult to get into any sub specialties like cardiology and stuff like that so dr nelly says dr raju can i confirm the aep clinical education pathway is based on teaching experience and not having publication that is correct so the clinical clinical educator pathway is a pathway offered in anesthesia 
This is based mostly on educational accomplishment, not research accomplishments. Yes. So what they look for in this path eh, is experience about teaching, about things like how have you trained your residents, your fellows, how successful they are. Are you involved in any projects related to quality improvement, patient safety, things like that. And the success is actually based on this more so than research publications. But if you have publications, that definitely helps because that establishes that you have gone over and beyond to not only accomplish educationally, but also put that into print. All right, the next question is from Dr. Castaneda, who says, as an old IMG trying to get into Canada in 2020, I assume you graduated in 2020, what would you recommend trying the family medicine pathway than PEATS, my main option? So I'm, I think you're trying to ask me what would be the residency I should be picking, family medicine or pediatrics. So in general, in Canada, family medicine is relatively easier. I'm not saying super easy. It's relatively easier than pediatrics to match. There are a few family medicine residency spots which was left vacant this past residency matching program. I, I couldn't understand why. I was very surprised when I looked at the data. Hopefully, Hopefully, you know, there's something I missed, but anyway, so family medicine is relatively easier. Can we get a research fellowship in the USA without USMLE? Yes, you can. A research fellowship does not require a USMLE because you don't have any patient contacts with this research fellowship. But once you think of having anything where you're having contact with patients, like a clinical fellowship, then USMLA is a must. Well, there are exceptions, but we won't get there. Dr. Mona Krishnan Sridhar asks, how about cardiology fellowship immediately after IM residency in the USA? You're, you're certainly eligible to get a cardiology fellowship, assuming you finish your internal medicine residency in USA you would be in a pretty good shape to apply for cardiology fellowship. Remember, there is pros and cons for cardiology fellowship. Cardiology is oversaturated. Now, cardiology has become so subspecialized that people have been doing second year, third year fellowships. I have really close friends who are IMGs or cardiologists presently practicing in the USA. So I keep talking to them as to, and they tell me how competitive and how saturated the market for cardiology has become. But anyway, you are in a good shape to get a cardiology fellowship. The next question from Dr. Gaya says, is it difficult for an immigrant doctor from India post MBBS to get into general surgery residency in Canada? Yes, it is. It is quite difficult. The way people go about it is they either would have completed their general surgery residency from India or they would join into some research aspects in a general surgery program in the US, get to know consultants and build their CV gradually and then become competitive into entering a general surgery residency program. It's not like it's an absolute no. There are IMGs who are doing general surgery, who have been specialized in many surgical specialties, but it takes time and persistence. Dr. Edel says, thanks a ton for replying to my question and what visa did you go to USA? Are you a citizen of Canada yet? If on green card, how difficult was it for you? All right, so Dr. Edel, I did make a video about myself um, well, specifically about my transition from a visa to a green card. I am a U.S. citizen and um, I came through what is called as an EB-1 green card. An EB-1 is given for 
uh, people who have outstanding achievements. So there are various categories of EB1. And uh, I came on an H1B visa to the US and immediately after I transitioned to a EB1 green card through what is called as the Outstanding Researcher and Professor Pathway. And following that, I became a US citizen, which I am right now. How difficult was it for you? Thankfully for me, it was, it was not too difficult. Well, the difficult part was proving the fact that I am an outstanding researcher and a professor. Now, the US CIS, the Customs and Immigration, have set forth various criteria. So they have six criteria for someone to be eligible for these EB1 pathways. And they say you have to meet two out of the six criteria. I say you have to meet all six. So you have to show your excellence in all those criteria. So I did that through the EB1 pathway. So my hospital sponsored my EB1 green card. And fortunately, it got approved. I did my adjustment of status to becoming a permanent resident in the USA. And the requirement is you be, you be a permanent resident for at least five years in the U.S. before you become a U.S. citizen. All right. So Dr. Mahesh asks, can you guide how to get into research fellowship? I mean, the approach. The approach for getting into research fellowship stays the same. So essentially, you... First, focus on what your specialization is. And then you make a strong application with a letter of intent, your CV, and then apply to the departments. Or if you find a researcher in a department, you can apply directly to them. But essentially, your approach for applying to either a clinical fellowship or a research fellowship, in my opinion, is not significantly different. You follow the same road because ultimately, you want to be successful in getting a position in these pathways. Dr. Gagan Kumar asks, Sir, is research necessary and important to getting into the residency programs for ophthalmology or psychiatry? No, you're looking into two extremely different specialties, Dr. Gagan. For psychiatry, you don't need any research uh, it's not necessary, not important. IMGs do match in psychiatry. But ophthalmology is extremely difficult. I rarely see IMGs in ophthalmology. Not that they don't exist. They're very rare. Two reasons. One is there are very limited number of spots in ophthalmology. It is highly paid. There is another reason. Excellent lifestyle. They don't take calls, or rather, I should say, when they take calls, it's not busy. So ophthalmology is a very desirable specialty. To get into ophthalmology, you need to, yeah, be pretty good at research, and you need to have publications. You need to even probably have a residency from your home country in ophthalmology. Yeah, ophthalmology is not easy. Uh, Dr. Maloti asks, can USMLE exams be used in Canada? <laughs> this is a great question. This used to be the case many years ago. And then Canada realized we can make a lot more money. Well, maybe Canada realized they're better off with MCCQ1. So now, no, you cannot use USMLE exams for Canada. The only option is MCCQ1. All right. The next question says, hello, doctor. I want to move to Canada after my internal medicine residency in USA. Is it better to work as a hospitalist from some time in Canada or directly apply for fellowships? I would. Okay. If you want to move to Canada after your internal medicine residency in USA, I would directly apply for a fellowship. I don't think you need to spend more time working as a hospitalist unless you really want to but not for the purpose of fellowship given the fact that you have already done an internal medicine residency in the usa you would be eligible to get a pretty good fellowship in canada 
I have seen people do this. I've seen people move back and forth and they get a pretty good fellowship. So Dr. J.A.K. asks, how hard is it to get into an intervention radiology fellowship in Canada? It is very difficult, but I can say if you have the requisite experience, now when you think of intervention radiology, the things they are looking for is how excellent you are in terms of your clinical skills. Because unlike diagnostic radiology, where they also look for academic throughput, in intervention radiology, this is all skill-based. Now, if you come with a lot of excellent training, good references, then you would be at a pretty competitive spot to apply for intervention radiology fellowship in Canada. Interestingly, uh, I have a really good friend who did an intervention radiology fellowship from uh, University of Toronto, an IMG. The next question from Spider007 says, I saw the requirements for the fellow of University of Calgary. The fund scholarship from my institution is necessarily, is that sure? I'm sorry, I don't get the question. If you can rephrase that, then I would be happy to answer that question. Dr. Manohar Sharma says, do old graduates match into surgical residency in USA? You just mentioned about some research experience, how to get into research in surgery in USA from India. And can you elaborate a bit? Yeah, so surgery is a specialty where you might be benefiting because of your years of experience plus your skills because it's a skill-based specialty. Now, in order to get into research in surgery in the USA, you follow the same methodology. You apply based on the things I mentioned to you regarding sending an application to the program, making an excellent letter of intent, your CV, your profile picture, and then in addition to just asking for a, for a research position, you also have to say, what values you're bringing you know that is crucial they want to hire an excellent candidate eventually is that making sense okay the next question says hello sir what if crs i'm not entirely sure what does that mean if crs is 400 for an img doctor still he can be able to apply for canada pr oh i see it's the it's the permanent residency score. How many days it will take for MCC to complete the verification and to provide ECA report to apply? In terms of your immigration question, I again suggest you speak to a qualified immigration attorney because I am not one. And how many days will it take for MCC to complete the verification? They have taken anywhere approximately three months, but they have taken longer than that. So it really depends on how busy they are. And especially with COVID, they did have a lot of backlog and I hear IMG saying they're taking a lot more time than before. Dr. Mohan Krishnan says, sorry for not being clear, sir. I was under the impression only people with PR or Canadian citizen can apply. Oh, I see. No, so you're saying once you're completed your residency training in the USA, you do not need to be a Canadian PR, not a citizen to apply for a fellowship in Canada. You can do that on a work permit. Does that answer your question? And then eventually you can apply for Canada PR if you wish to continue to stay in Canada. So you do not have to worry about, especially training from the U.S., you do not have to worry about PR in Canada or a citizenship because Canada highly values training in the U.S. Okay, so it was fantastic. I did not realize we already spent two hours talking about all this. 
All right, I did get another question, so I might as well take this. How did you manage to finish USMLE Step 1 or MCCQE1 and publications during your anesthesia fellowship at U of T? Great talent you are, cause I have heard anesthesia fellowship is pretty hectic with long hours. So Dr. Adel, thank you. So you're really motivating me to make a video about myself, which I think I definitely should do. So let me tell you. I said I did my residency from India from, uh, thankfully, I got matched into one of the excellent programs in India, PGI ME or Chandigarh. So in order to get that, it's not easy. It's highly competitive. So it's like getting into Harvard Medical School in the US. So I had to read a lot. So I felt like my baseline knowledge for writing USMLA was, was pretty solid. And for that reason, once I started doing fellowship in Canada, I did not have to spend much time taking USMLA exams. I spent a few weeks and I was comfortable, confident enough that I would really ace the exam. And uh, thankfully, during those times, the score was reported as both a three-digit and a two-digit score. And we went by two-digit scores and... I got more than 95 on all the steps with just a few weeks of reading because what I read for my Indian residency programs really helped me have a high baseline knowledge that reduced the time I took to take my USMLE. Are you right? Anesthesia fellowship is pretty hectic with long hours. Interestingly, when I did my residency in India, I they had a solid management of time. So I never worked for more than 12, 13 hours, which is now the regulation in the US. I had a pretty good, um, you know, time management during my residency. I was shocked when I worked for 24 hours for the first time when I did my anesthesia fellowship in uh, Toronto, because that's how it was. Sure, they, they tend to be a lot more busier, but then once you once you know how to manage your time, I think IMGs can be successful in finishing these exams. You know, these exams are not about studying hard, but studying smart. You have to focus on the right materials and high yield topics to get a high score. And interestingly, I made a video on MCCQ1 on how to focus on the right strategies to get a high score. So that's getting edited from my editor. So hopefully I'll be releasing that soon. All right, I'm getting more questions. Uh, Dr. Pupa, I'm sorry if I didn't say that right, says, thanks for the wonderful content and answering live. I want to ask after completing IMG residency as an IM residency, as an IMG, how should I apply to a cardiology fellowship? So this is true across the board. As an IMG, applying for research fellowship or clinical fellowship, you're not going through any standard matching or anything. So essentially, you find the individual departments in which you're interested in and send an email to the chair along with your personal statement or letter of intent, really nicely made professional CV and your profile picture. So that's all you need. And it's pretty standard across the board, all specialties. You just follow the same strategy. All right, Dr. Ramesh Babu asks, what are the chances for Indian MBBS doctor in Canada, either job or study? Now, Dr. Ramesh, if you want to continue as a physician in Canada, your only option is to do residency. It's very competitive. So as I said, only 10 to 15% of IMGs match every year in, in Canada because there are so many applicants. It is not easy. You really have to build yourself up make your CV stronger, and come with a really strong application when you apply for your residency. Now, in terms of job, you can look for some research job, but when you look for research job, make sure Canada has a national occupational classification categories. So make sure you get a job in those categories that will make you eligible to get a Canadian permanent residency through the Canadian experience class. 
this is really critical there is a huge competition for this so come up with a strong application lot of time persistence is is what will make you successful dr adil says you are the first youtuber to answer all the questions thank you well i don't want to be recognized as a youtuber but someone who actually can help you all out because i have seen the struggles of an img and i think imgs are those professionals who are very experienced and who bring in so much value at least based on those people i've seen so i do really want to uh, help help you all out answer these questions because you cannot find these questions online i mean you can spend a lot of time looking on google or even chat gpt but you would not be find able to find and these answers to these questions because this is based so much on experience first hand experience of seeing people and that's what makes it unique all right dr reena asks what is the work hours for fellows in canada so dr reena it's going to be pretty competitive it's going to be long hours so as an img this is something you should never ask the program this is not going to go well <laughs> instead you should say i am ready to work hard irrespective of the time hours but once you start the program anyway it's a different story but you may want to come out as a strong applicant who is really ready to work hard and and be you know give your fullest to the program all right i have a few thanks and i also want to thank you all for staying in and being so interactive i really enjoy answering your questions and since i'm getting more questions let's see clinical fellows must have financial support from a funding source approved by pgme clinical fellows are not permitted to use personal finances resources to fully this quote is about from guide of clinical fellows policy so i want to clarify this that there are two types of fellowships i didn't mention this earlier so one is where your government sponsors you as a candidate to come into canada the other thing is where the hospitals in canada pays you salary for being a fellow now the thing you're saying is a funding source approved by pgme is for those countries where the fellows come in and say with with their own money with the government money an example is singapore so singapore sends people to canada to do fellowship and sing, the, the government of singapore the ministry of health in singapore pays the hospitals in canada to send their fellows now the hospital is happy because they're getting money and they're getting a fellow so this is what you're referring to but for the most part most imgs from countries like india pakistan caribbean algeria other countries do not have this option because the governments are not going to say i'm going to pay you money to go to canada but rather you should be or you will be looking for a position where the hospitals will pay your salary is this making sense what the difference is all right dr manohar sharma says sir if we didn't do surgical residency in home country can we still apply for research and surgery in usa and can you provide some link for the same certainly you can apply for a uh, resident for research in surgery as a fresh mbbs student or a fresh medical student so the link for the same would depend on going to individual departments so you should focus on university hospitals big university hospitals and you go to individual hospitals and then apply for a research fellow there and then the way you apply is it's always helpful if you have some internal connections but it never hurts to apply one other thing you could do as i'm talking about this you all imgs can do is first come to us as an observer so get a b1 b2 visa come in as a clinical observer so you're going to spend let's say a week two weeks or whatever it is in the usa 
And during that time, you can explore the research options that exist in that particular hospitals or in that particular department. So you have made that internal connection. So next, your possibility of getting a research position goes up. And then you use that research position as a stepping stone to get into your next phase, which is doing residency. This is something you, you, you can do if you think you have the time, money, and bandwidth to do all this. Is this making sense? All right. Let's see. Doctor um, says, thank you, sir. I'm a gynecologist and an infertility specialist in Ethiopia. What is the probability of matching in gynops in USA? Well, again, as I said, it's pretty competitive. But since you come with a pretty good experience and you come from Ethiopia, which on paper has its own benefits in terms of being being an underserved area and you can highlight those in your letter of intent in your application to make yourself more competitive well it is difficult i can say it in general for most specialties but there is certainly an option for you applying because you come with a, a huge experience and you come from ethiopia So Dr. Gudda says, that's a great motivation. I'm a fresh graduate and don't remember anything from first year. You're not alone. Everybody goes through the same thing. But as I said, the focus is to study smart and focus on high yield topics. If you have a good baseline knowledge, which comes by reading textbooks, in my opinion, then you can always build up on, let's say, focusing on USMLE world or first aid or whatever it is. In match, is there any age limitation? On paper, there is none. But it depends on a lot of different factors, especially what your training background is and where you're coming from and, and many other factors. What the program is looking for. Do you Are you a good fit for the program? You know, there are so many different things there. But on paper now, there is no limit for age. In fact, I have seen, uh, at least I've heard of uh, IMGs who are, uh, who are uh, 60 year old doing residency. I haven't seen this, but I've heard from an IMG friend about this. So anything is possible. All right, so I really enjoyed talking to you all and uh, answering your questions. I do hope you found this helpful. Again, I want to emphasize that if you want my personal help, you can always look at www.imgsecrets.com and look for options to book an appointment with me. I will be certainly glad to help you on those things. Of course, there's a, there's a cost for that because I get so many, so many requests. I just don't have time to... I, I wish I had more time to help all of you, but unfortunately I don't. I have 24 hours just like you all. So anyway, if you need my help, you can always reach out there. And it was always fantastic talking to you. And uh, do follow videos, which I release every week. And then I plan to do these live sessions once a month. And um, so... Uh, because I really enjoy talking to you all. So I wish you all the best. Again, uh, do reach out if you have any further questions. And uh, thank you all. Take care. Stay safe. I will talk to you soon.